I appreciate you guys coming on and talking to us and I won't take a lot of your time. So my first question is, so people have an understanding. So our story is about, you know, in the COVID era, people are seeing doctors. People have to rely on doctors. People want to know they can rely on doctors. And they also want to know that the doctors are going to are, you know, good doctors, essentially. So what is the role of the Texas Medical Board? Well, the role of the medical board is, you know, our mission statement includes that we both license and we educate and we discipline physicians and our other licensees. We also license physician assistants, uh, medical radiologic technologists, respiratory care practitioners, acupuncturists, surgical assistants, and I'm sure I'm leaving one out. But we, we license about 160,000 total licensees, 90,000 of whom are physicians. And we do exercise oversight over them. So we license them. We make sure they keep up with their continuing education. We also, when necessary, we investigate complaints that we receive and take disciplinary action as appropriate. In terms of the body of the Texas Medical Board, what is it composed of? How often do you meet? How does it all work? For the medical board specifically, dealing with physicians, there are 19 board members 10 of them are physicians, either medical doctors or osteopathic doctors. Uh, the rest remain are uh, public members. They're all appointed by the governor to the board. They are subject to confirmation by the legislature, but they're all appointed by the, the governor. And we meet uh, in person or during COVID uh, by Microsoft Teams five times a year. Five times a year. Um it's a lot of people to manage and a lot of things to review for meeting just five times a year. Well, it can be the meetings are full. They do meet for two days uh, each time they break into committees. So you have a licensure committee, you have a disciplinary process committee, and then you have the full board uh, that meets on Friday. It's, it's pretty, they, they can process um, several hundred actions over those two days. How does, so, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to trip you up, but we've come across some doctors we have questions about. One of them has been convicted of a federal crime, is awaiting sentencing, literally has to report to prison uh, coming up here in a month or two. Um, and we're wondering why that guy is still practicing. Well, it, it does. It can take some time. And that is frustrating for us sometimes, too. Um, you really kind of have to look at the, the individual case and the, and the facts of each case because there are kind of different tracks that these cases can go down. So the legislature has given uh, the medical board, as well as most licensing authorities, a lot of different tools that you can use to make sure that when one of our licensees does break the law and they're found guilty or plead guilty, that we can take an action most of those tools we cannot use until the criminal process has come to an, an end. It so, has in this case, though. This doctor who's in Baytown, I mean, he's been convicted. He is literally going to report to prison so, and still practicing. I mean, I went to his office. He did an interview with me. Right. So and I, I, I obviously I can't talk about any specific case that still may come up for the board. But in that situation that you're talking about, um, I think the important thing to note is that in a situation where a, it might be reported that a physician has been found guilty or pled guilty, there is still some process that goes on. And so um, you might have a guilty plea, and then it might be a couple of months before the judge signs that guilty plea. And then, as you said, there might be a certain amount of time that passes before that individual has to report to prison. And so, But in this case, and Chris, I don't want to cut you off, but in this specific case, he is literally pled guilty. It was a plea deal. And he's been sentenced. I mean, I've seen the paperwork. He's reporting to prison and still practicing. So what we can do in those situations where you have someone who's been, um, who's pled guilty and had their sentencing, we still have a process that has to take place at the board. So there's not an automatic revocation or an automatic suspension in a case like that. There are different tools and different scenarios where some things are faster but norm, the normal process would be once with the board learns there's been a guilty plea or a finding of guilt by a jury, we will obtain the official court documents and records. And then we have to provide notice to the licensee of the specific violations of the Medical Practice Act and give them an opportunity to be heard. The question After is, how big is that gap? Because that's where the public comes in. How big is the gap 
there? It, it can take, it does depend on, on some things. It does, that, that particular process, if somebody, ple- if a physician pleads guilty to a felony or is found guilty by a jury, um, it, it doesn't take an, a, a, a tremendous amount of time for the board to get the documents, but it can take longer, I think, than people would think it would. Uh, you do need certified copies. A lot of times you're still talking about things being mailed. It's not always something that can be faxed or attached to an email. Sometimes it is. Are we measuring that time period in weeks or months? It would be, that part of it would be weeks. But after we get that material gathered together and notify the licensee that we are going to move forward with the disciplinary action, we do have to give them notice. The And, and that can be, that can start looking into the months. Um you could in theory do it as quick as 30 days, but to have time to get the, the hearing members set up and get everything ready to go, it's more likely 60 to 70 days. So all but, in, so, it But during that minutes. time though, isn't, I mean, that, that's our question. And, and I, I'm really not, I mean, you're, you're a lawyer, I'm not gonna outsmart you, but isn't that gap though, that 60 or 70 days or in some cases longer than that? I mean, isn't that a problem for the public? Isn't that a problem for the patients who are seeing that doctor? It, it certainly can be, and in, in, in certain cases, if we through uh, if there is evidence that they pose an immediate threat to patient health or safety, we do have some authority to take an emergency suspension that would put a licensee out of practice um, more. How quickly. often does that happen? We do that anywhere from forty to fifty times a year. What does it um, take for that to happen? Well, so in a situation like that, we would need to have we would need to both prove that the violation more likely than not occurred. And we'd have a second barrier burden that we would have to meet, which is to prove that the licensee uh, poses a continuing and ongoing threat to patient health or safety. And sometimes you can do that, obviously, if it's an assaultive offense against a patient, something that's like a sexual offense against a patient, in many cases, uh, that might be present. If you're talking about something where it's fraud, um, sometimes the judge in the criminal case will have put some conditions on the defendant while they're going through the process that may mitigate the actual harm that was part of the criminal case. So we we weigh that as well. Um, To show that there's a continuing ongoing threat for a financial crime, and that's not to say there's not harm to patients or the community because there definitely is. And we do proceed and we do try to, to discipline, including suspend and revoke doctors that are found guilty of those violations. But to, to move it up to that level where you would take an emergency suspension, you would be looking for something, a more immediate threat of harm to a patient. So I'm clear, you're not going to talk about individual doctors with us. Correct. Got it. So here is my question in a theoretical sense. So this person was convicted of a federal fraud type charge, but has a laundry list of problems they've had with the Texas Medical Board over the years. I mean, there's a record there of trouble. Still no emergency action? All of those, all of those factors in any case. So we, we actually have a board rule that allows us to consider prior disciplinary action by the board as an aggravating factor. Again, it's, I, I like to think of it in terms of, you know, a pre-deprivation deprivation due process or a post-deprivation due process. And if you're going to take away somebody's right to practice or their ability to practice medicine before you've given them an opportunity to respond to the allegations, even if they're guilty of sin, frankly, you do still have to give them some sort of process. And that includes their opportunity to show up and tell their side of the story and ask the board to give them something short of a revocation or a suspension if they think that's appropriate. That doesn't mean the board's going to do that. The board may go forward and suspend and revoke the physician and never license them again, but it still has to take place after some process. So if you're going to take that emergency action before you've given them the opportunity to answer the allegations, even if it seems to somebody from reading what they've read in the, you know, in the media or something, it's a very obvious person's pled guilty, we still have protections, even in those situations, to give people an opportunity to kind of tell their side of the story before the board makes a decision. Uh, And again, when you're talking about prior history with the board, again, it's important to remember that part of that emergency suspension is to show there's a continuing and ongoing threat. And so if it's something- So that's the threshold, whether or not you keep your license. I mean, if you are 
I mean, it seems like you can get in a hell of a lot of trouble before you, you guys start pulling licenses. And not necessarily. And that's not the trigger for losing your license. So if you're going to take a license, you're going to actually revoke the license. All these other things we've been talking about are suspension. So they're temporary actions. Nobody's permanently suspended. So if we're going to take a final revocation action, that, that will take place following an administrative hearing at the State Office of Administrative Hearings. So it's something that looks a little bit like a trial, except there's no jury, there'd just be a judge. But you would go through that process. And during that process, there would be discovery, you would have depositions, maybe you would have motions argued to the judge, and then you have a hearing date. And then you'd have time for the judge to make a decision. And then you would come back to the board. So that process takes a lot longer than just to How long is that from notice to revocation? How long does that take? If we're going to go forward with the full revocation and not all of that schedule is under our control because we, we now have an outside judge and they have their own scheduling issues and that they have to meet. But the quickest it would really ever happen would be about nine to 12 months and it can take longer. And what about uh, for suspension? If you're going to put the same sort of number of months on it. I mean, and I know every case is different and, and there's a, there are variables in there, but in a general sense. So if it's nine to 12 months for revocation, what is it for suspension? So there are different types of suspension. If we are going to do one of those emergency suspensions that I talked about, there are situations where we can suspend a licensee the same day we find out about the violation. How often does that, that happen? Uh, I, I hate to give an exact number. I would say fewer than 15 times a year. Um, and then there are, and then if you're talking about the suspension, we have the authority, the legislature has given us the authority to suspend a licensee after they've pled guilty or been found guilty by a trier of fact, a judge or jury. And then they would stay suspended while we go through that other process at SOA to take a revocation. In those situations, uh, that's where you were asking me earlier, that's where it would take somewhere in that range of two to five months. Got it. Um, I, I appreciate you answering my questions. This isn't 60 minutes, and I'll ask you just a few more, and we'll be all done. The, um, the other question is, so it seems like you guys really rely on self-reporting to learn of this stuff. It depends on the, it, it depends. So this is, a, this is another area of the law that's kind of, our, of, the, of the regulation that is changing. So the legislature has been going back each session and requiring all kinds of occupational licensees, not just those licensed by the medical board, to enter the fingerprint system, and then the agencies can subscribe to the um, subscribe to that database. I believe it's run by the FBI, and then we get what I call a push notification. It probably has a different term uh, for everybody, but for me, I would call it a push notification. So, for some of our licensees, if they get arrested on Tuesday, we'll get a push notification by Friday. So that's for individuals. Why just some licensees? So they, the, all of our licensees in certain categories are already in that fingerprint system. For physicians, all new physicians are being, as they are, are licensed in Texas initially go through that process. So they get that fingerprint and they're in that system. Since that when? Is it. Um, I would have to get back to you on when we started that. It's been several years. But I mean, you've got a lot of doctors who have been practicing for decades. Their fingerprints aren't in the system, right? That's true. And, and they, we do expect at some point we will be asked to go back and, and do that. It is a, you're asking 90,000 physicians and whatever number of them are not yet in that system to go get re-finger fingerprinted and added. So there is some I mean, but in that. the name of public safety. It, I think it's important to do it, and and we are doing it for our physician assistants are going through that process right now, uh, where they are um, where they are getting uh, fingerprinted and getting added to that system. All of our medical radiological technologists, respiratory care practitioners are already in that. All of our newly licensed physicians are in it, and I expect at some point we will be asked to go back. In the in the interim, we do require physicians they renew every two years. And on those renewals, they are required to answer questions, including whether they've been arrested during that time frame. And but we they do lie. Learn about, sorry, Some of them lie. That well, they do. They can also be um, disciplined for that for providing false information to the board. Um, and we do sometimes learn about it from from newspaper stories or news stories. We do sometimes learn about it from individual complainants. 
And we do sometimes learn about it directly from law enforcement who, who should make a report to the medical board if they know the individual that they've arrested has a license. And so we do have several other mechanisms in the interim where we try to try to learn um, how that how that happens. And if they, you know, we also have work with DPS. So if DPS, uh, they can also report if a licensee is arrested uh, to the medical boards. There are other ways that we can find out about it. I will say there are times when the first time we learn one of our licensees has been arrested or even convicted is through through a news report. And that frustrates um, us as well, because all that means some of those other safeguards weren't met. And eventually we will have everybody in this fingerprinting system so that that doesn't continue to happen. I think we're good, Chris. I really appreciate your time. And unless there's any parting comment you want to make, I, I would appreciate the follow-up um, from you guys in terms of uh, when the fingerprinting system for the, the newer type doctors was instituted, just so I'm complete on that part of it. We can get that for you. I appreciate it. Uh, thanks a lot, sir.